From the attacks in Brussels, Nice and Orlando to Brexit and the U.S. presidential race, 2016 has already been an historic year. Does it have historical precedence? And how might historians of the future view the year in which we're living? We could hardly imagine anyone better to consider such questions than author and historian, the warden of St. Anthony's College, and professor of international history at the University of Oxford. Welcome back, Margaret McMillan. Thank you. Good to have you in that chair again. Well, okay, let's, uh, you know, we're always curious as to about what lessons we can learn from history given the times we're in, so let's do that. How was history used, for example, in the Brexit debate over whether or not to stay or to leave the EU? Well, it was used um, often very badly and often incorrectly, particularly by the Leave campaign, who painted a picture of a glorious independent Britain in the past. They talked about the British Empire. They talked about the spirit of Dunkirk. They talked about the glorious isolation of Britain in the past. And I think it was wrongly used because it portrayed a Britain that never existed. Britain was always and has always been involved in the continent. And British kings often had continental relatives. The British royal family was, was essentially German. Um, and still is in, in many ways. And so I think it was wrongly used. And I think the Remain campaign never really managed to counter that very, very nostalgic narrative. So this is one of those things where don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Exactly. And you know, huh. when you appeal to nostalgia, you know, it's, it, you get at people's emotions and not at their rational side. Having said that, you're a historian. Don't you love it when history is brought to bear in a campaign? Well, I like history being used, of course, but it annoys me when history is used, as I see it incorrectly, hmm. when claims are made in the name of history, which simply are unfounded. And there was a lot of that in the Brexit campaign. Did historians come forward and say, you, you guys are on thin ice with all this stuff. That's not how it happened at all. You know, historians did come forward. I'm not sure anyone listened to us, but something like 300, in my view, very good British historians signed a letter saying, look, we think that Britain has always been part of Europe. We, we dislike this whole misuse of history. There was a much smaller group of historians, uh, mainly historians of Britain itself, who were for leave. But I would say, you know, pound for pound or quality for quality, the, the Remain historians were an awful lot better than the Leave historians. I think I know how you're going to answer this question, but we seem to be living in a time, and I don't know how much historical precedent there is for this, when facts don't matter, but how you feel about stuff does. Well, I think that is absolutely right. I mean, in fact, you have people like Michael Gove, who was one of the leading Brexit campaigners, Tory, in, in the UK, saying, we don't need to listen to experts. You know, why should we listen to experts? And I think you see that in, in a lot of the appeal that Donald Trump has. I mean, he doesn't listen to experts. He, he doesn't think it's necessary to listen to experts. He makes up his own mind. And so I do think we're living in a time when people say, I don't really know much about the facts, but I feel. And so you've got a lot of people in England saying, I just feel that Britain would be better off out of the European Union without really knowing whether or not it would be, without having really looked at the arguments. And I think that's happened before. I mean, I think in a way the appeal of the extremes in the 1930s, whether they were on the left or on the right, whether they were communists or, or varieties of fascists, were on that emotional basis. You know, Germany will be great again. Italy will have another Roman Empire. Mm. I mean, that matters, and people do often respond. We're, we're not rational beings. We like to think we are. Well, if we're in a time, and we have been before, as you suggest, where facts are less important maybe than ever, and feelings are more important than ever, if you're running a campaign, how, how are you supposed to deal with that? I don't know. I think it's a real problem. I think it's a real problem for journalists such as you. Hmm. How do you deal with often inflated claims that are being made? I mean, Donald Trump, for example. I mean, I, I'm sorry to keep on going on about Donald Trump, but he's much in he's the topical. news. He's topical. Topical. It says, you know, Mexicans are rapists and thieves and murderers. Hmm. I mean, how do you deal with that? You point to the statistics which show that, in fact, Mexicans commit fewer murders per head than American natural hmm. citizens commit per head. But it somehow doesn't get through. I guess you just keep hammering at it. And you have to hope that in the schools we educate the younger generation to be skeptical about what they're being told, to ask questions, to probe, to say, wait a minute, those figures, let me know the basis for that. I, mm. I don't think we're doing that nearly enough. Let me come back to Brexit for a second. It was the subject of some discussion on this program not too long ago. And Michael Corrin, who I guess originally is from over there and is now over here, uh, had this to say about that. Roll tape, please. A lot of the other towns, irrespective of the ethnicity of the people, by the way, it's illusory to think that it was only white working class people. A lot of people who are brown and black said, we don't want to be told what to think and how to feel any longer. To a degree, yes, globalization has passed us by, but that's not the only issue here. There was something visceral and something emotional. They simply believed that the country they had grown up with was changing radically. And, and here's an important point to make, because I've heard a lot of people say, well, it was racism. 
In a way, it may have been, but it wasn't racism against people from the former British Empire or Commonwealth. It was people from Poland and Romania, good, fine people, but were coming into Britain and transforming the nature and the employment force of the country. How much of that analysis do you want to sign on to? No, I think he's absolutely right. Um, what is curious about it is it was the areas which had the fewest immigrants from places like Poland who were the most anti-immigrant. And so I think the immigrant from Poland or the immigrant from Romania or the fear of three million immigrants from Turkey, which was totally unfounded, but nevertheless people began to believe, it was the fear and the perception rather than the actuality. And I think immigrants got blamed for a lot of things that people didn't like about their lives. Um, it was partly a way, I think, of expressing an anti-elite feeling. We're fed up with these elites, whether in Brussels or, or London, telling us what to do, and we're going to show them what we think. Uh, apropos of what we were talking about just before the camera started rolling here, you were telling me about something on Google, the oh. second most searched, yep. what was it? The day after the result came out, I think it was a Friday, the second most asked question on the UK Google platform was, what is the European Union? And so I think a lot of the vote was, we don't like our present situation. We don't like our elites. We don't trust them. We feel we're being manipulated. I think part of it is a reaction to globalization. But I think there's a general anti-elite mood in the world at the moment. And I think a lot of that was expressed. But a lot of the people who voted against the European Union really, I think, voted because they wanted to, to, to sort of, in a rude expression, show the finger <laughs> to people in London and Brussels and not really because they'd, they'd really grappled with the issues of whether the European Union was good or bad. A lot of British farmers voted against the European Union, although they get huge subsidies. They get subsidies. huge subsidies, yeah. yeah. So the inference that, uh, that I guess you're drawing from that search was people are railing against something and they don't even know what it is. Is that right? I do think that's true, yeah. because in the debate in England, you've got a lot of people saying the European Union makes us do this and that. And there's a lot of stuff about the European Union saying bananas can only curve a certain amount or cucumbers can only be a certain shape, which is absolutely untrue. But these things become, they're factoids. They become, they become fixed in the public imagination and they became symbols of what people thought was unwanted interference. Of course, the British government interferes and local governments interfere much more than Brussels do, but people didn't really take it like that. We do have to remember, it was a close vote, right? It was like 52, 48 yeah. or something like that. So it was a, a, a bit of a razor thin margin of victory here. W was there a victory for Remain to have or do you think that we're just going through such an anti-establishment, anti-anti-everything phase right now that there were no arguments that could have won. Well, I, I think, no, I do think Remain could have won. I think they ran a bad campaign. Hmm. What they tried to do was do it on economic grounds, whereas Leave did it on, Leave the European Union did it very much on emotional grounds, hmm. appealing, as we've said, to, to history and to nostalgia. And Remain never really counted that, never really posed an alternative view of British history, saying, look, Britain's history has always been intertwined with that of Europe. I mean, Britain's, hmm. we, we know, when, when we're, as Canadians, we always say we're going to Europe. And we include Britain in, in the rest of Europe. And I think that point was never made in Britain itself. How would you characterize the various campaigns run by, alternatively, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party? Well, the Conservative Party was deeply divided. And I think Theresa May, who's now the Prime Minister, is a very good example of that. I mean, she was notionally for Remain, but she kept awfully quiet. Mm. And she kept her avenues, uh, channels open to the, to the Leave people. Worked and out for her. It did work out for her very she's well. She's the boss now. Yeah, well, now she's got to sort it out, which yeah. may not be as easy. Mm -hmm. And the lab Labour really didn't run a campaign. I mean, Labour is for Remain, or was for Remain, mm -hmm. but Jeremy Corbyn was, was basically not there. I mean, I mm -hmm. think he probably wanted to leave, but he was obliged to go along with party policy, but he did not say very much, and he wasn't very effective. So if you were looking for your political leaders for guidance on which barricades to storm, it was complicated, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of them were just absent. Hmm. And some of the people who were most effective were people who were no longer in Parliament, like Gordon Brown. And, hmm. you know, that's the trouble. When you start relying on people who, who, who are not actually engaged in politics, it says something about the failure of political leadership. This may be a question that only, you know, political junkies are going to be interested in, but let's try it anyway. You know, there's a school of thought that says that referendums are not a good idea ever, that you are undermining the authority of the people that you've elected to make those decisions. Yeah. Are, are you in that camp? Yes, I think I am. Um, partly because I don't trust my own knowledge and, and ability to make decisions about complicated issues. I mean, I want to elect someone who is going to be thinking about the major problems facing this country and the world full time, and that's their job. And I may turn them out if I think they're not doing a good job. I may turn them out. I may not vote for them the next time if I think they're not really um, dealing with important issues or if I disagree with their approach. But I don't want to have to decide on every complex trade issue, every complex social policy. I want people to do it for me. And I think the trouble with referendums, apart from that, I mean, I think they, they undermine parliament and the authority of parliament. But I think what referendums do is simplify questions. So it's yes or no. 
And mm -hmm. often questions aren't just a yes or no. They're a yes, maybe, yes, but, but let's try and change things. And so when you get to something like Brexit, in or out, you know, it isn't, it simplifies what is a very complex issue. Mm -hmm. Is it going to remain muddy as the decision makers try to figure out what Brexit actually means and whether they can actually do it? I think muddy is putting it mildly. I hmm. think it's going to remain deeply confusing. Probably for the next four or five years, it's going to take up a huge amount of British energy. They haven't got enough trade negotiators. I mean, Canada has something like 300 trade negotiators in the federal government because we need to do it. Britain, I think, at the start of this had 30. And they're desperately hiring people. They're, they're, they're going to places like New Zealand and Canada to try to get experienced trade negotiators. I think they haven't really worked out, um, the Conservative Party hasn't really worked out what sort of exit it would like. There's, there's a whole range of, sort of remaining in but doing some sort of deal and getting out completely. They haven't worked that out. I think it's going to be a complete mess and the Europeans are going to get fed up with it. So I think it's going to be an un a difficult negotiation or set of negotiations. I, I'm going to assume that you're a strong champion of the European Union and the, Euro yeah. the, the European project, given yeah. your knowledge of yeah. you know, how, how many awful wars have been fought on that yeah. continent. In which case, how concerned are you that Brexit is the first of many dominoes to come of the unraveling of this thing? Well, I am worried, and I know the European Union isn't Europe itself, but it's a very important part of the unity of Europe, just as, as NATO is, and I know they're not perfect. I know the European Union could do with a lot of reforming, like any political institution, but I am worried that Europe will begin to unravel. I mean, you have Russia over on one side, which I think is willing to make mischief because it would like to see an unraveling of Europe. You have other parties, and you have in France the, the Front National, Marine Le Pen is absolutely delighted with the Brexit result mm. and is pushing for a Frexit, for a French exit vote. You have nationalist parties in, in countries such as Denmark, the Netherlands, um, Hungary, of course, Poland. I mean, this is worrying. And you have old issues beginning to surface between countries. I mean, I think one of the things the Remain campaign should have done is remind people what it was like when Europe wasn't united. And as you pointed out, uh, world wars, the horrors that European rivalries brought in the 20th century, um, and the horrors that they brought earlier in the 30 mm. Years' War, for example. I mean, it's not been a peaceful continent. It, this is a totally unfair question, but you know, I do that for a living. But just as you've looked at events of 100 years ago, and you can point to, aha, there's the moment when, do you suspect that there are going to be historians 100 years from now who are going to look back at this moment and say, that's when it started to fall apart. I hope not. I sincerely hope not. But, you know, I think decisions like this have incalculable consequences. I mean, we can't predict what is going to happen. And the Brexit vote has given encouragement to those who would like to see Europe further splintered and further pull apart. And I'm hoping very much that we look back and say that was a silly moment or that was a moment that we managed to deal with or Europeans managed to deal with. But I am worried. Yes, I am. Because mm. it's, it's not a time for what has been a very stable part of the world to start fracturing. There so many other parts of the world and so many other problems we need to deal with. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to quote you to you. Here we go. You want to bring this up here, Sheldon? The Britain of the future will be smaller, poorer, possibly meaner, and certainly less relevant in the world. That is only partly a problem for the British themselves. What should concern us all is what it means for the rest of us. The EU has been dealt a blow, perhaps a mortal one. It is not inconceivable that the EU will fall to pieces. Russian President Vladimir Putin must be laughing his head off in the Kremlin. The world as we know it is changing, and not for the better. You sound darn pessimistic right now. I know, I do. Well, I wrote yeah. that, I think, um, on the day of, of the result, and I was feeling very pessimistic. I'm not sure a lot has changed since. I mean, I think I'd probably say something similar. I mean, I hope, I and mean, we all hope that wiser heads will prevail, that people say, look, we have to do some sort of deal. You, you know, you have to deal with people you don't necessarily like. You have to go into arrangements you don't necessarily like. I mean, look at the way the provinces in this country have to deal with each other. We don't always agree with each other, but we sort of muddle along together. No one kills anybody. Nobody kills anyone, and that's very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know I've asked you in the past about uh, the dangers of not learning the lessons from history, and I think your response at the time was there's always the danger of overlearning the lessons yeah. from history or taking the wrong lesson yeah. from history. Having said that, I think the last time we talked, it was on your uh, last excellent book uh, on the First World War, The War That Ended Peace, The Road to 1914. And again, I, one never knows how far to push these comparisons, but let's try. The gathering storm, clouds, whatever you want to call them right now, how much of what's happening reminds you of pre-1914? Well, it does in, in rather uncomfortable ways, although history never repeats itself. I mean, we're in a different world in so many ways, as a result, of course, of 1914 and, and two world wars. But what worries me is the growth of uh, radical nationalism, 
um, a hostility to those who aren't like us, uh, talk about Western values. I mean, this whole thing in France over the, the, the bikini, mm. you know, and, and women not being allowed to wear headscarves. I mean, it, there's an element there that is, is very troubling, I think. I think the period before 1914 was a great period of global, global, globalization mm. and a reaction to it. Mm. And so we're seeing, I think, in the Brexit vote, a reaction to globalization. We're seeing a, a complicated power shift between a great power and a rising power. Before, before 1914, we saw that between, say, Britain and Germany or Britain and the United States. Mm. We're now seeing something similar between the United States and China. So yes, there are parallels, but I think we have more institutions. Let's hope our collective leaders have some memory of how things went wrong in the past and, and realize that they better not take chances. More institutions, but the public support for those institutions seems to be at an all-time low. And even if they are doing a reasonably good job, you'd never be able to convince the public today that they are. So does that help us enough? Well, I don't know how you convince the public, because really what we need to say to people is, look, every time you get on an airplane and take an international flight, you are benefiting from an international institution, which mm -hmm. makes sure that those pilots are properly trained and mm -hmm. the plane is fueled and it has proper and equipment And it doesn't on hit board. another plane. It doesn't hit another plane. <laughs> yeah. You know, that our world is very interlocking, mm -hmm. and we've come to take that for granted, but we have to understand, and I guess it's our, all of our responsibility, that, that that interlocking world is made possible by the interlocking of institutions and agreements. Mm -hmm. There are... A number of disparate things that have happened so far this year that have been pretty controversial, Brexit being controversial, the events in Syria are appalling, never mind controversial, the terrorist incident that happened in Nice. As you look at these disparate events, do you see something that interconnects them all? No, I don't. Um, I think a number, of, well, of course they're connected because in a way they affect each other, but I think there are a number of parallel things happening mm. which tend to make us think it's all falling to pieces. And I think we have to be careful of overreacting. I mean, I think what's happening in Syria is very much partly what's the domestic issues in Syria itself, but it's also partly great power meddling from outside. Mm -hmm. um, the terrorist acts are not really, I think, as a result of what's happening in Syria. They, they, they are running on a separate and parallel track. So yes, in some ways they, they, can, they can be connected because ISIS is active both in Syria and in, and in trying to carry out these terrorist acts. But I think we need to deal with them as separate issues. And I think the international terrorist threat that we, that we face, to me, is really an issue of policing and good policing. I think to talk about a war on terror is to elevate what are essentially criminals into warriors, and I don't think they are. I mean, I think they're criminals, they're murderers, and they should be treated like that. And I think the best way to deal with the terrorist threat is by and large to do it through international policing. Well, as politicians figure out how they're supposed to respond to this kind of thing, I don't mean this in a facetious way at all. Do, do, do they call you or do they, I mean, I, I would want to know whether politicians consult with somebody who knows a lot about the last hundred years and how these things, yeah. what these things are or are not. Nobody calls me. Well, <laughs> some people, no, I, I, I did go and talk um, to some, some people in Washington who, who, who asked, you know, just wanted me to talk about the past. And I think, you know, when I look at people who have been effective uh, leaders, I think they often have a great sense of history. I mean, you think of Winston Churchill, he had an, a huge sense of history. I think Obama has a sense of history, President Obama has a sense of history, and I do think it helps them. But there has been a move, actually, by some historians in the United States to set up a council of historical advisors. I suspect it will go nowhere. Hmm. Would it be useful? I think it would be useful, but it, you have to persuade the political leaders of that and the other mm -hmm. leaders of that. You know, the, they have to be persuaded that it's useful to listen to historians, and, and that's, a, that's a difficult thing. We're, we're seen as you know, people who fuss around in musty archives and don't have much useful to say. You do more than fuss around, don't you? Well, occasionally. Yes, occasionally I, think I get so. out there and talk. I but. think so. Let's finish up on this. Uh, we have, I guess, since the election of the, uh, you know what, I was about to say Pierre Trudeau, because that's where I am of that vintage. But it's Justin Trudeau, who is the Prime Minister of Canada, since last October. And, uh, you know, there's this business in Canada now that we are into a phase of sunny ways. And as you look around, we do seem to be headed in one direction, while the rest of the world seems to be headed in a different direction. Right. As you look, you know, obviously you're Canadian, but you're over there on the other side of the pond a lot of the time. Does it look to you like we're doing something different and or better and or more right than the rest of the world? Yes, I think it does. And, and certainly people in the UK and, and elsewhere, because I've been traveling a bit this summer to Sweden, for example, have said to me, aren't you lucky? And isn't Canada a bright spot? And you seem to be building 
um, a society that works. I mean, I think you know, a lot of Europeans are very concerned about immigration and how you integrate migrants into their societies. And they look at Canada and they see a society that has taken huge numbers of migrants in, in proportion to its population and has done very well in building a solid society that works. And I think Canada is seen as a bright spot. And I think, you know, let's hope it remains that. We've got 40 years of practice with the Multiculturalism Act that they don't have in Europe and haven't had in Europe. So yeah. that may explain some of that. Yeah, and they should, they should have come to look at what we do. And mm. I think our schools are hugely important as a means of integrating people. You know, when people go to school together, when they work together, they learn about each other in very important ways, um, much more, I think, than if they're just told to be nice to each other. In which case, how would you react to the news that came out uh, not too long ago that there are some uh, Muslim parents in this city who want to take their kids out of music class because the Quran forbids the playing or listening of music? Well, I think it's sad because the Quran doesn't do that. And I think you would find plenty of Islamic scholars who would say there is nothing in the Quran to forbid music. And there is, in fact, a very rich tradition of music in many Islamic civilizations. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that the Quran forbids music, I think, is, is a very, very narrow interpretation. You can always find whatever you want mm -hmm. in, 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 in holy writings. And I think we've seen that with Christianity as well. But I think it's sad. And I think the parents are picking on the wrong thing. I think mm -hmm. they perhaps are worried about their children becoming acculturated and becoming part of a Western culture. But that is going to happen even if they listen to music or not. Hmm. You ever throw up your hands and say, this world is just too messed up? Oh, well, yes. But being a historian, I think you, 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 I don't know, it doesn't make us cynical, but it just gives us a sense that, you know, things go on somehow. Um, we have to hope that the world will right itself eventually. And, you know, we do tend to look at the grim things, and there are some really good signs. I mean, look at Latin America. There hasn't been a major war there for, what, 100 years now? Asia is very largely peaceful. Uh, huge numbers of people in the world have been lifted out of poverty. Um, Africa, which we tend to concentrate on the, on the gloomy side of Africa. In fact, Africa in many ways is a success story. It's got huge growth rates, people living better, people living longer. I think we need to remember that. Amen. Margaret McMillan, it's always great to have you here at TVO. Thanks so much for the visit. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.